It's Monday, November 16th, 2020, and this is your Daily Detroit. Hey all, I'm Jer Stays. Today's show is big and it's in three parts. First, the latest coronavirus numbers and the city of Detroit's strategy to combat this latest wave of the virus. Then, Dr. Paul Thomas breaks down the three-week pause announced Sunday and what's next. And then finally, Fletcher Sharp weighs in on a Pistons trade, the Lions' field goal victory, the Red Wings' reverse retro jerseys, and more. Let's get started after we thank our newest member, Brian. It's folks like him that keep this very podcast going. Community funding and the fact that we own our own thing means we're responsive to you and what you want to know about. So join us at patreon.com slash daily Detroit and thank you. Let's get started. The state had nearly 20,000 confirmed COVID-19 cases since we last spoke on Friday, bringing the pandemic total to more than 264,500 over the weekend. We also lost another 70 people in that time. This brings the pandemic death total in Michigan to 8,049. In Macomb County, they're experiencing 730 new cases a day on average, with more than 86 cases per day per 100,000 people. Oakland County's rate is 62 per 100,000, and Wayne approaching 46. Taken alone, each of these counties' single-day case totals are higher than the whole state was in the low point of the summer. Positive COVID test rates are high throughout the region. McCombs is 17%, Oakland 13.1%, Wayne 12.6%, and the city of Detroit is 6.8%. Hospital capacity is stretched thin. According to a briefing by the city of Detroit, Suburban hospitals are basically full and COVID-19 cases are being shipped to hospitals in the city where there are fewer cases. There is talk of trying to expand hospital capacities in place and maybe down the line reactivating the field hospital at the TCF Center. More on the city of Detroit in a bit. As you may know, on Sunday, Governor Gretchen Whitmer outlined a rollback on openings of various businesses and strongly encouraged people to curtail their Thanksgiving in-person gatherings. I will link to the full thing in the show notes. But for the next three weeks, eating indoors at bars and restaurants is off the table. So are in-person classes in high schools. Bowling alleys are closed. Organized sports except for the pros in college. Casinos, movie theaters, ice skating rinks, and group fitness classes are all paused. In response, members of the Michigan State House have called for Whitmer to be impeached. Representative Matt Maddock of Outer Oakland County posted on social media that he wants impeachment hearings, quote, forthwith. I can't even with all of this, so let's move on to the city of Detroit. That's where Mayor Mike Duggan, a former hospital system CEO, outlined new measures to combat the virus. As I shared, the city's positive COVID-19 test rate is far below the rest of the region. And after being hit hard early on, the city has, to borrow a phrase, not been playing around. The city is one of the few areas in the country where residents can get free tests throughout the week with turnarounds in 24 to 48 hours, thanks to a contract Duggan negotiated early on in the pandemic with testing labs. That's available now at the Joseph Walker Williams Recreation Center on Rosa Parks. You can make an appointment if you're a resident by calling 313-230-0505. And today, Duggan rolled out a new feature of the city's website to anonymously report businesses with perceived COVID-19 safety violations, as well as without warning inspections of school buildings in the city. When it comes to businesses, the city has empowered inspectors to issue $1,000 fines on the spot as well as shut down businesses. They'll also often be paired with a Detroit police officer to help with enforcement. Duggan also said that since the city has been open with casinos and other entertainment, people from across the region have been coming into the city, and so there has been more case spread here. Unlike the governor who pointed to three weeks, the mayor characterized this as a three-month phase which my gut tells me with winter coming is more realistic. Joining me on the line virtually is Dr. Paul Thomas. There was some news over the weekend, sir. Yes, there was a big news announcement at 6 p.m. on Sunday evening. Uh, Hopefully everybody tuned in and saw that one. Right, and and let's make sure we break it down because... It's kind of a a modified rollback. The restrictions, they're definitely strong, but they're nowhere near what they were earlier in the pandemic. What do you think were some of the thoughts behind these modifications? We are seeing a huge crescendo and a huge increase in the number of cases of coronavirus. 
and it's causing some hospital systems to be strained. It's causing more deaths, and it's causing a disruption in our society. And so I think these steps needed to be taken to stop the spread of the virus and calm things down as we head into the holiday season. Yeah, I think a lot of people are bummed out about the situation with Thanksgiving, and it feels like we're kind of back to that idea of what we had all the way in Easter. Remember all that talk? Oh, we'll be gone by Easter, right? Oh, yeah. We'll be gone by Easter. Uh, the summer heat wave is going to burn this virus up. <laughs> we'll have a vaccine by the election. All that stuff. And it's like, uh, it's kind of wishful thinking. And here we are with huge increases in cases and a lot of difficulty that we're facing as individuals, as, as a health system and as a society. You mentioned wishful thinking. There's a phrase I think listeners will know that I tend to use kind of called magical thinking, where people continually push these restrictions as far as they can, or they think about like, what is the letter of the restriction versus what is the spirit of it? And we keep trying to open and do things but it seems like every time we do, the virus then makes a pretty strong appearance back. One of the regular pushbacks by some of our listeners is that there's no way these numbers could be real. This morning, I have a message in my in inbox that I would have to have sponge for brains to think that we could hit 100 deaths a day or even the uh, higher projections that were talked about yesterday of 1,000 deaths per week. What's the disconnect here, Doc? Well, I, I think if... You think about it, we have 10 million residents in the state of Michigan, and if 1% of people get infected each week, that's 100,000 new cases. And then if 0.1% of those people die from the virus, that's 100 deaths a day. And so if you look at the size of our state, the number of residents, and then you just do a little bit of simple math, you can find that it'd be very easy for 1% of your population to catch this virus each day. And it'd be very easy for 0.1% of those folks to die each day. And and you look at the type of people that might get infected in the coming weeks, especially around Thanksgiving. You've got younger people who think they may be immune to the virus, going out to bars and restaurants, maybe getting a asymptomatic or slightly symptomatic case. Maybe they just have a headache and a fever. They go visit with grandpa and grandma around the Thanksgiving table. And then grandpa and grandma come down with this virus and potentially pass away from this. That's why these restrictions are in place. If you looked at them, there was one about you know only having a two-household gathering and being very careful at that. I think the governor, I think the health department, they're all worried about elderly folks becoming affected by their younger family members, their grandchildren, basically. Well, let's go through kind of what's open and not open. We'll kind of focus on the not open things because I think there was some pushback whether you've got restaurants, movie theaters... People, they say, they look at the overall, well, where are the epidemics from or where are the cases traced so far from, right? And they're saying, well, we're only 3% or 4% or 8% of these different things. Why is it that these particular items were shut down? And, and when you think about movie theaters, restaurants, you know, high schools for in-person learning, those kind of things. Yeah, let's start with the high schools. I think high schoolers have the mental capacity and discipline to be able to sit at a computer or at a desk and do their work. Whereas younger children, like uh, preschool through eighth grade, they're still allowed to go to school because I don't think they have that capacity to sit still for long enough to learn like that. And so I think that's a reasonable way to do it. And then you're looking at other places where mostly you're indoors, enclosed, close to other people, like movie theaters, bowling alleys, restaurants, casinos, etc., and I think those places are your highest risk for the spread of the virus. They've done studies about this. It's, it comes down to a lack of ventilation, having people close together, and those conditions make it really good for the virus to spread. One of the things I think about these tracing numbers is that the contact tracers in general, by every third-party metric we're seeing, are overwhelmed. So I, I wonder if we don't actually have a real idea on where all the things are, because I've been hearing story after story about people not self-reporting or not even signing in those sheets if they go to a restaurant, things like that. I don't know what the resistance is from people in our state, in our country, but you know we all have a role to play in preventing the virus and preventing the spread of the virus. And that is by reporting when we're sick, when we become sick, it's ideal to self-quarantine for two to three weeks because you can shed the virus for that amount of time. 
and fill out those cards if you choose to go out to a restaurant, although that's not going to be an option going forward for the next three weeks or so. Yeah, I think we all need to understand that we are all in this together and individual actions have a huge impact on the spread of the virus. How important is that community action component? The idea of community spread requires community lack of action. And I can only judge by my inbox and people that I talk to that there is just just so much pushback on this one. Yeah, I think you're seeing it all up and down from all of the different recommendations. People are finding ways to get around the recommendations from not wearing a mask when they go to the store or, you know, wearing a a mesh mask that's clearly like see-through. But uh, we all have to understand that the typical person who gets this virus is going to spread it to at least two other people. The spread on this is like typically 2.2. So if you get infected and you spread it to two other people and they spread it to two other people, pretty soon you have this exponential growth of spread in the community. And we need to understand that if you're infected, if you have symptoms, you need to stay at home, stop that chain of spread. And it's the only way we can uh, prevent this going forward. Right now they're saying three weeks. If you put on your crystal ball, what do you think? I don't know how they go much further than that. I think that there's going to be a lot of pushback from Republican lawmakers. Are they going to magically appear? (laughs) We'll see. (laughs) And I think there's going to be a lot of pushback from retailers and restaurants because, you know, this holiday season, I I feel for my fellow small business people, you know, this is a very difficult call to make by our governor and other people in our state government. And it could be crippling and it could be the end of a lot of restaurants and small businesses in our community. And I'm sure that the governor and her team aren't taking that lightly, but they're weighing the risks and benefits And obviously the risks are too high right now to continue with business as usual, or we risk infecting more people and having more deaths and more overwhelmed hospital systems. Well, and it's really tough to do this without any sort of backstop. I know you're a a doctor and not an economist, but one of the things that's different between now and what happened in the spring is there was actually a financials backstop deployed to help these folks to do this for this amount of time without any sort of federal backstop and the state really doesn't have the money is very difficult. Uh, It's extremely difficult. You know, we're a small business. We receive some PPP funding to help our business get through the coronavirus pandemic. And we may or may not get that amount of money fulfilled by the government unless this next package of bills goes through. And, you know, if you think about the individuals, the restaurant workers who are going to be having a hard time through this pandemic, They need something like that to get through this. And I just wish that we had some compassionate, caring people at the federal level who could have a robust response. You know, when you talk about a robust response to a pandemic, if you have the financial backing for small businesses, and if you have the financial backing for individuals who are inevitably going to be laid off because of shutdowns like this, then this wouldn't be as terrible. But without those things, it becomes a much worse situation. I almost wonder if that is an intentional policy decision on their part, but that's my own. Those are my own thoughts. I wanted to ask you, another thing we hear a lot is that coronavirus cases make you doctors a lot of money. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, you know, for me, I take care of people in the community and people pay us over and above their insurance or if they're uninsured or they're in the gap between Medicaid and private insurance. We take care of a lot of restaurant workers, bartenders, truck drivers, hairdressers, et cetera. So we want people to be working in the economy because if people are working, have good paying jobs, then they support our clinic and are able to stay with us long term. We've had a lot of people cancel because they've lost work because of the pandemic or things have changed because of the pandemic or the restaurant has furloughed them or whatever. And so they can't afford our memberships anymore. So you know, the pandemic is definitely not making us a ton of money. That's for sure. And I don't know how that works in the insurance world. I think there is some more reimbursement that hospitals get paid if they have a patient who is confirmed to have coronavirus and if they have a coronavirus patient in the ICU. But that money isn't going to the individual doctor who takes care of them. The doctor has already signed a contract and gets paid a salary typically by the hospital and doesn't get a bonus for seeing more coronavirus patients. And if you think about the infrastructure that the hospital has to put up to take care of coronavirus patients, solo rooms, isolation rooms, when you typically could have 
two patients to a room, then you're looking at losing money. And I think some of those packages are designed to help hospitals with a lower capacity but higher acuity needs. And you think about the number of specialists that have to take care of a hospitalized patient with coronavirus, you might need more hands-on like pulmonologist for the respiratory issues, a cardiologist for any uh, blood clots that may develop secondary to having coronavirus, et cetera. And so it becomes a more costly course of care for that patient who's hospitalized with coronavirus. And I don't think hospitals are making a ton of money on this pandemic either. So there are my two cents. (laughs) Well, let's end this with some good news, because just before we started recording this, we have news that Moderna says preliminary trial data shows its coronavirus vaccine is more than 94 percent effective, which means that we now have two really strong vaccine candidates. Right, Doc? Yeah, it's you know looking brighter and brighter. It remains to be seen how many doses that they're going to be able to produce and how quickly. But, um, you know, it's promising that we have two vaccine candidates and that they're progressing through their trials and making strides to have a candidate vaccine. So it definitely looks better. You know, it's the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe in three to six months, we'll have enough vaccines to cover the vast majority of our population in the United States, maybe getting to that 60% immunity status that we need to get back to a normal life. And that's hopeful. You know, it could be three to six months from now that we pull out of this and that'd be phenomenal. That would be phenomenal. And I was going to ask you about that timeline. If things continue on this path and, you know, knock on wood, I'm finding wood anywhere in the studio. Here we go. Yeah, I'm knocking on wood. We've got a a three to six. I mean, in my mind, you know, I kind of prep for the worst in my mind, but uh, three to six month window that things could really start to improve. Yeah. And I think if you look at this, I think on the long end, it would be 18 months. Pandemics usually take about 18 months to you know, run their course. So if you're looking from March of this year, or if you want to call it December, uh, if you talk from a global perspective, all the way through, let's say, June or September of 2021, that's probably going to be the end of it, hopefully. And I think the vaccine will accelerate that maybe by a few months. Dr. Paul Thomas, Plum Health Direct Primary Care, thank you so much for your time today. Hey, thanks for having me on. And everybody, wash your hands, wear a mask, keep your physical distance, and stay safe over the holidays, please. Joining me virtually is Fletcher Sharp. It is Monday. I don't want to say it's Monday morning quarterbacking, but it kind of is. I mean, it's kind of stereotypical to think sports on Monday, right, Fletch? That's the only type of quarterbacking I can do after my high school career ended, so I'll take it. (laughs) Well, did you score a bunch of touchdowns in your high school game like Al Bundy? In JV, yes. (laughs) They didn't let me play varsity. I was the the scout team quarterback, so uh, yeah. (laughs) Well, let's kick off with the Pistons topic near and dear to your heart. I know the Basketball is uh, something that that you love very much. The Pistons traded guard Bruce Brown to the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, In the deal, ESPN reports it'll be for forward Dazan and Musa and a 2021 second round pick. And that pick is going to come from the Toronto Raptors. Fletch, it seems like the Pistons put a lot into this 24-year-old to trade him away. Yeah, I didn't really like Bruce Brown, the player, so much. I understand it's about being patient. When the Pistons drafted him out at University of Miami, uh, he was a shooting guard. Not really undersized, but really more of like a muscle guard, I guess. And the Pistons saw uh, a little bit of Russell Westbrook, the current Houston Rockets guard, former Oklahoma City guard. They saw a bit of Russell Westbrook at him as a strong defensive point guard who has a bunch of athleticism, who can get to the hoop and, you know, finish. So they're like, we're going to turn him from a shooting guard into a point guard. And that's going to benefit us. And they're like, just be patient. It's going to be a progress. Like, we need to, like, be patient with this. And people were like, cool. Yeah, he's turning the ball over multiple times. Yeah, he's doing this. Yeah, he's getting to the hoop and not finishing. But you know what? We're going to sit here and be patient. We're going to be sitting here and, you know, figure it out. It's going to be okay. It's not the end of the world. And then COVID happened and into the season. So I understand, like, yes, that happens. It's going to cut into, like, playing time and such. But, like, from that point forward until, like, yesterday, Bruce Brown is still very much a part of of the Pistons' plans going forward. I wouldn't say he's an un- he was an untouchable player, but like he was a, go- a part going forward. Even with the draft picks, either whether they're, whether they're going to draft Killian Hayes, whether they're going to draft LaMelo Ball, or whoever they're going to draft, he was still seen as a part of the team. So like now to be like, you know what? Let's give him up for another person drafted earlier in the same draft, a late, late, late draft pick, because the Raptors are going to have it probably have a pretty good year. Let's get another late draft pick that we're probably going to then either waste or 
draft a kid and then not sign him. The biggest indictment for me, I guess, in this trade is all the Pistons fans are like, dang, we're losing Bruce Brown. I looked up the guy they're trading for. I only found three things. Podcast for the Brooklyn Nets, who are like jokingly talking about how they're getting rid of a player who is so uh, automatic. He, he doesn't play for five games and comes in and shoots five possessions in a row. I saw a video, one of those highlight videos they make of players, except with him, it was all of his air balls all season. And the last one was just fans just mocking him. Oh, so like I, they don't really miss him at all. <laughs> the Brooklyn Nets are not missing this player. So I'm like, we're giving away someone we actually value for a player. We don't really value per se. And for a draft pick, we really aren't like unless it's for trade value later, like they're trying to get like some star to come in. I don't really see the point of this trade at all do you have any idea what the motivation could be if it just doesn't make sense only thing i can really think of is unless they're really about to say hey we're gonna package this together and then if some big star becomes available we can trade for i know there are some rumblings about the Pistons trying to sign russell westbrook which i implore upon them not to do russell westbrook's kind of like alan iverson to me in the standpoint of like you enjoy watching this player when he's not wearing your jersey Mm. like i loved alan iverson i really do one of the greatest nba players ever when he played with the 76ers, I was like, yes. When he played with the Denver Nuggets, I was like, yes. When he played for the Pistons, I was like, yes, until the first game. And I was like, oh my God, I can't watch this. Like, I love him, but he just makes my blood pressure go up so much because he makes so many mistakes I didn't notice before because I was really not watching the game intently because I don't really care about the Nuggets or the 76ers. I care about the Pistons. And to see like some of his lapses, I'm like, man, I don't like this. But then he went to the Grizzlies and I was like, yes, I love enjoy watching Allen Iverson all over again. That's kind of crazy. I feel like Russell West, even watching Russell Westbrook for these other teams, just I see his mistakes and I'm like, I'm glad I'm not supporting that team because I watched him make that mistake. I'd be really upset right now. Aside from maybe trying to obtain a player like him to pair with Blake Griffin, I don't see a point in this trade. I really don't because you're trading for, I guess, a younger player but a younger, more expensive player who the team's not missing. Like, he didn't play for the Nets. Obviously, the Nets are a better team than the Pistons. They finish better. They have a better, younger core. He didn't play for them hardly at all. And like I said, he could go five games and not play and then all of a sudden come in. And his first response, which I've noticed from a lot of younger European players who don't play in the NBA, as soon as they come in, they're like, I'm shooting the ball. Do not care, not passing, not shooting. Slava Medvedenko used to play for the Lakers when they played the Pistons in the final. He didn't play for like two games and they brought him in. And against Rashid Wallace, he shot like 10 times in a row. And Kobe was like, get this guy out of here. We're done. We're done. Get him out of here. And I don't want a player to come in there who like does not play much. Come into this already like young, I wouldn't say fragile, but like not solidified core and just be like, I'm going to shoot now because it's not going to go well. I assure you it's not going to go well with Coach Casey. Either he's going to play and play his way or he's not going to play. And if he doesn't play at all, it is a waste of trade. Well, let's switch gears to the Lions, which almost did a repeat of their fateful mistakes of losing everything in the game, but pulled it out at the very end with a 59-yard field goal to beat the Washington football team, the football team without even a name, uh, 30-27 to on Sunday. This was hard to watch again. I was on and off watching. I saw the Lions were up 24 nothing, and I was like, yeah, game's over. You know what? Good for them. You shouldn't be so confident, Fletch. We know better. The R team that plays out of Washington, they also have the same luck as the Lions. Maybe a small bit better, but like they're cursed. So I figured, you know, we're we're pretty good. And then I like looked up and I saw a former media friend of mine post like Lions are just lining. I'm like, what are you talking about? And it's like, up. Oh. <laughs> it's 27 27. Like, what happened? And it's like Alex Smith had a career day, and I'm like, oh my god. His first game back from that horrible, horrifying knee injury, and you let him become a star? Ah. <laughs> it's like the Battle of the Dumpster Fires. I watched the the game-tying kick from Dustin Hopkins, and I was like, oh, man, they're going to overtime against this team. They're really going to lose. The whole NFC East, the whole division, I don't know if you know this or not, is under 500 by far. Like, the best team in the NFC East currently are the Philadelphia Eagles, and I think they're like 3-5-1. and one. Like, it's not good. They're very bad. Lions almost lost it, and then they got lucky that they got a roughing the passer decision to get them within Prater's range, which honestly I think is about, like, indoor, I think it's about 67, 60, 70 yards. He could probably kick it from, like, a good five yards behind the logo if he wanted to. That's insane. They got within 59 yards, and he had, a, he had an ugly knuckleballer, an ugly, ugly knuckleball. But, uh... If you understand baseball, if you understand football, or even soccer, when the ball left his foot and you saw it bend left and then start to bend back, you knew it was going in. Like you knew like that ball's gonna knuckle back the other way. Or at least you hoped it would. 
because because otherwise that's a really ugly kick to decision to try to make. I will say this about Prater: if the Lions did not have Jason Hansen in their history of kickers, he's the best kicker in Lions history. Wow, best kicker in Lions history. More consistent than people give him credit for. He has his moments, but he's easily one of the best kickers, if not the best kicker from fifty-five plus. Um, he has the record for the longest kick in NFL history, which most people probably knew already. 64 yards, he beat out Tom Dempsey, the man with the iron foot, and Jason Elam as well. They're still not going to make the playoffs. If they do, I remember the bet I made, I have to get a tattoo, and I will do it. I'm going to honor that bet. I'll post pictures, I'll say, you know what, I'm a man of my honor. I'm not worried, though, because they're still not going to make the playoffs. Because these situations where like they almost lose it and then win it at the end, only happen against teams that are worse than them, and there aren't many teams like that left in their schedule. Well, one of them is the Panthers. That's uh, coming right right up ahead of us. They're only three and seven right now. Yeah, but they're an exciting three and seven. What does that mean? It means that you have to pay attention the entire game because if you don't, uh, they have an offense that will bring them back. Their uh, quarterback Teddy Bridgewater, who some people might be familiar with from his college days, some people might be familiar with from his time at, with the Minnesota Vikings. He's a really good quarterback, and he's f- kind of finding his groove now. And uh, I've watched the past few games of his, and I don't want to be the defense to face him. The Lions struggle with quarterbacks who are a little bit mobile and can throw. Teddy Bridgewater is a little bit mobile and can throw, and he can do both pretty well if you give him time. And the Lions will definitely give him time. Well, on the college ball, Michigan State got clobbered. Yeah, I, I, I don't really know what we expected here. Uh, they're only going to have one win this season. And honestly, every single State fan I've talked to has been like, you know what, if we only have one win and it's against Michigan, okay. I don't care anymore. It's this guy's first year coaching for the team. We understand. It's going to be rough. We both are going to have bad seasons and we can say our season's better than theirs because we beat them. (laughs) I want to play that SNL uh, clip from Lowered Expectation. That's really it. (laughs) I don't really have any more to add to add for them. Well, then let's talk Michigan football then. Same thing. Like I, I mean, I know Michigan fans had a higher expectation because they are expecting the most out of Harbaugh. A lot of them no, no disrespect. A lot of them have a bit more of inflated importance about their football team than they should nationally. Michigan does have a storied program. I won't take that away from them at all. But like other states don't really care. Like that's one thing if it's like we're the best here. But then, you know, Stanford talks, Alabama talks, USC talks, Florida talks. And it's like, well, what do you say back? Because against all those teams, you don't beat them. And the team that you, that you are in rival with, Ohio State, also doesn't beat them. I'm of the sound mind of you can only talk if you win. If you're not winning, then you kind of don't really get to talk. Yeah, both of those teams got cleaned out by top 10 schools. And it's clear to me that there's just a ton of work that needs to be done. The one plus that I will say is because of them losing to Wisconsin, Wisconsin now has a 13% chance to win the national championship. So that's good for the Big Ten, I guess. Mm. There was one nice local moment in that game, which I have to mention because uh, it's near and dear to my heart. First play of Michigan's offensive series, Joe Milton throws a pass that's deflected. It's caught and intercepted by Scotty Nelson, uh, Wisconsin safety. Scotty Nelson is from Michigan. He went to UD Jesuit. Shouts out to the Cubs. He played basketball in high school with Cassius Winston. Cassius Winston's final year where he won Mr. Basketball, uh, Scotty Nelson was the lockdown defensive specialist and corner three-point specialist. After the interception, he ran off the field, took off his helmet, went up to the first camera and yelled, this one's for you, Smoothie. Smoothie is Cassius Winston's brother, Zachary, who played on the team. Zachary passed away last year, unfortunately, and the fact that he can bring this bond in his first shining moment from playing uh, after a year of injuries, his first thing he does is go to a camera and acknowledge that's really That's a really special moment. It made me very misty-eyed. I don't really get misty-eyed watching sports. That is a touching story. Well, the Wings are kind of quiet right now. But there is a lot of social media talk because whenever there's a new jersey, people lose their minds. And there is this new reverse retro jersey by the Wings. And not just the Wings, all the NHL clubs. I personally believe the Wings kind of drew the short end of the stick on these retro reverse jerseys. I kind of understand why, but I don't know. This thing, and I'll I'll post links to it uh, with the pictures. But I just, I'm not inspired by just an extra gray line somewhere. One, I don't really know what retro reverse means. Retro reverse to me means <laughs> forward. Yeah, it's a dumb name. So retro reverse means these jerseys are from the future and not the past. But wh- whatever, people call stuff what they want to call it, and I have to just say okay, because I do the same thing sometimes. To your point about the Wings jersey, I don't know why Wings fans are like, why is our jersey so plain? Have you seen all the Red Wings jerseys of the past? Like, they're historically great program on the ice. But, like, their jerseys have, like, been the same. The jerseys they're wearing now are very, 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 very similar to the jerseys they wore in the beginning. The only difference is maybe a few modern uh, uptakes, a few modern, you know, stitches here somewhere else. But, like, the jerseys are basically the same. 
Same with like say the uh, St. Louis Blues. There's maybe a bit more white in the jersey than there was before, but like the jerseys are basically the same. So if you want something like more exciting, you got to go to like you know Los Angeles Kings or you know the Anaheim Ducks or even the Winnipeg Jets to, the, to some degree. You have a historic jersey. It's like the New York Yankees in baseball. They wear the pinstripes. You want a retro New York Yankee jersey? It's going to look a lot like the curtain one they're wearing. Maybe a little bit more fuzzy, but like the same same thing. So like I don't know why people are like, well, why don't we get an exciting jersey? Because if they did, the old time people would freak out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true. Detroit loves its tradition. I would have pushed towards something along the lines of the Detroit Cougars back in the day, the the wide stripes that, although it was back in like the 20s, 30s, it kind of had a resurgence in the 70s. There was even a 75th anniversary jersey that was kind of cool with wider stripes. We could have done something. I totally see your point, and, and I get it. I will say, though, some of the teams, I am glad to see a Whalers jersey back, for one. And the Nordiques, the, Nor- the Avalanche are honoring the Nordiques, which is near and dear to my heart because my, my dad was born in Quebec. So that's near and dear to my heart. I honestly was just really hoping that the, I know the Winnipeg Jets were a team way before and then they stopped having a team. I kind of really wish that their new jerseys were just Atlanta Thrashers jerseys because even though the Atlanta Thrashers were bad, I really loved them. One, because they basically, like Atlanta, tried to really embrace them. They tried to have events where people would go to the games. They took advantage of the fact that they are in a majority black city and they're like, we're going to have as many African-American faces on ice as we can. And they were bad. Like they had Evander Kane, who was like a stud, but like they took the corpse of Anson Carter and put him on the ice and said, let's do something here. And like, it, it wasn't, it was bad. It was very unwatchable and hard, but they got little John to come to a game. So if you get little John to come to a game and like pump up the crowd, Hey, you're doing something right. So I really would have wished Winnipeg Jets would have had an old Atlanta Thrashers jersey, but I understand why, because they do have old NHL NHL tradition. They want to honor that first. But I hope one time this year they break out an Atlanta Thrashers jersey just to mess with people. <laughs> that would be fun. All right, Fletch, before I let you go, there was this three-week pause that was put in uh, by the state health department in regards to coronavirus. On the sports side, pro sports and college sports can still play, but with no fans. And they were very clear no attendance in the press conference, but this does really mess with youth sports and tournaments. This was something you were worried about. I told them earlier. I'm like, if you don't want to break these kids' hearts, just don't play. Just don't. And I know it stinks to not have a chance to play. I have friends that are currently coaching for the Loyola High School football program, and like it was their first year together, kids I used to play football with. And like they've taken that program, which wasn't necessarily a bad program, but it wasn't kind of unheralded. They've taken that program to the playoffs, deep into the playoffs for the first time in a while. And they're like, we're going to play anyways. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> the governor shut it down like you guys aren't playing. And he's like, well, you know, we got to finish the season. I'm like, well, you can't. You can't. Like, it's literally like you're being told you won't be able to finish the season. It's like, well, it's just delayed. I'm like, you're going to have your kids out there playing. And like the dead cold of like J- January to play football. Nah, man, like the season's just going to be postponed or it's just going to stop. Like, that's it. And I told you guys earlier, they got mad at me when they heard what I said earlier in the year. I'm like, just don't play. I know it stinks. I know these some of these kids are seniors. They're not going to be back. I know some of these kids have you know college aspirations to play in college. I understand that. Yes, this is a bad implication for them, but like you're going to hurt them more if they play like most of their season and then have to stop because it's so bad out there. Just don't. I'd elect not to do it. I know U of D had to cancel a game because they had a uh, positive test for COVID and they caught a lot of flack for like, well, you know, that's bad for the rest of the conference. But it's like, look, like I, they're at least recognizing like, oh, man, like we don't want to spread this. We can't play. Let's stop. Let's not do this here because we don't want to you know, spread this and make things worse. But people fail to realize, again, asymptomatically, there is a, a wedding that happened. And I think about uh, 50 people are at that wedding. And they went out and, you know, after the wedding, hung out with people. 155 people or so tested positive from COVID from that wedding alone. Most of them had not been there. Seven people have died. All seven of those people who died did not go to the wedding. So like your kid could go play football. You give your kid a high five after the game. Then you go to work. And then like four of your coworkers die from COVID spread. That might have started from your kid playing in a game. Like I, it's just not worth it. Like it really isn't. I know it's sad because these people really want their kids to have these lasting memories. The kids really want to play sports because everyone wants to play. If you're a part of a sporting program, if I was a kid right now and I was being told I couldn't play, I'd be upset, but I'd understand why I couldn't play. Just if you don't want to hurt these kids further, just stop. Stop. Don't have any winter sports, which stinks. Let's figure this out. Let's put all our energy into figuring this out so we can go back to doing these things. Because like, if you don't figure it out and keep stopping and starting, stopping and starting, you're going to make this thing so much worse. Like You're not fixing anything by doing it. Another important development to look at, though, Fletch, especially with youth sports, is the vaccine. We now have two very hopeful candidates, one with more than 
Another one with more than 94% early efficacy, which is great news, even though it's, you know, as Dr. Paul Thomas said, months down the line till it's widespread. Uh, I feel like in youth sports, this is going to be something that's going to be really crucial to getting people on the field. And vaccines are just part of the whole school process. Like part of the whole routine is you just get your polio, your da da da, your da da da, get your vaccines, and then you go in. I feel like this could really help youth sports. I mean, it'll help if people get their kids to take it. If they don't, then it won't matter at all. That's kind of, I guess, the double-edged sword with, with most vaccines is they'll help you for the most part if you take them. But if you don't take them, then they won't. So you have to hope that everyone is on the same page there. And if they're not, then, you know, you run that risk of, you know, not being on the same page and potentially becoming the super spreader team, which would be a great, you know, intramural name, but like not really great in real practice. So it's like the softball team that I once knew that was called sad, but true. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Fletcher, thank you so much for spending time with us today. People can follow him at St. FDW on Twitter. And uh, good to talk to you. Catch again soon. Yep. Thanks for having me. And that's all for today's show. Tomorrow, we're helping you navigate Thanksgiving by spending locally with Eater Detroit's Brenna Houck. Thanks to Dr. Paul Thomas and Fletcher Sharp for joining us and Cheyenne Noserini for editing today. Remember, we are funded by our patrons at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. You're pretty awesome. And thank you. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Take care of each other and we will get through this together.